Solubility in Solution. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about solubility. And so this whole topic is going to revolve around substances that either do or do not dissolve into the solvent. And in general, solubility is technically defined as the amount of a given substance that can be dissolved in a certain amount of solvent. Now we're going to look at it more generally than that. We're going to look at whether something is soluble or not soluble in solution. So we've seen solutions that look like this, where we have a soluble substance, totally dissolves into solution. And now we're going to contrast it with an insoluble substance, something that just collects at the bottom of the container because it's not going to dissolve into solution. And basically, substances fall into three main categories of solubility. So soluble substances dissolve into solution completely. Okay. Now, there's an intermediate category called a sparingly or slightly soluble substance, and that means it's partially soluble. So that means some of it dissolves into solution, but a lot of it doesn't, and you can't dissolve a lot of it into the solvent. So it's going it's to be slightly soluble or sparingly soluble. And finally, insoluble substances basically don't dissolve at all, or a very, very tiny amount dissolves. So we would call those things insoluble. Now let's, in this context, we're going to talk about salts some more. And salts are ionic compounds. And we've seen these, especially during naming. We were picking them apart and looking at the charges on the ions and looking at these ionic compounds that basically are an anion and a cation held together by electrostatic attractions. So we're going to remind ourselves that ionic compounds are composed of a metal and a non-metal, where the metals form cations and the non-metals form anions. And salt is just another name for an ionic compound. Now, uh, these salts can be soluble, sparingly soluble, and insoluble, depending on what the cation is and what the anion is. And so there are general rules that cover whether a salt is soluble or not based on what it is composed of, what cations and anions it is composed of. Okay, so these are rules for predicting soluble salts. Okay, so these are the ones that go into solution. Now, just so you can get an idea how to read this chart. So if it contains these ions, okay, so I've kind of grouped them together. If it contains these ions, it's soluble Okay, and it tells you under what conditions it's soluble, and then any exceptions. Okay, and that's in this last column. All right, so now if it's an exception, that means it's not soluble, so it's insoluble. Okay, so anything with a group one metal cation, okay, lithium, sodium, potassium, rubidium, cesium, or ammonium, those are soluble. Okay, so salts containing these compounds are soluble. I've put no exceptions, but I'm sure that that isn't technically true. But basically, most salts, everything we're going to work with is going to be soluble if it contains these cations. Okay? So an anion that is contained in many soluble salts is nitrate. Okay? So NO3. And so, again, not very many exceptions. You know, I don't have anything listed here, so nothing that you have to worry about. So if you see nitrate that in the salt, then that salt is soluble. Now, most salts containing these halogen anions, so chloride, bromide, and iodide, we've seen these guys before, most of those guys are soluble too. Now, there are some important exceptions, including if the salt is part of, you know, if it has a copper cation, silver cation, lead, or mercury, okay? And so, and notice this is, these are plus one cations, okay? So if the salt contains one of these cations, then it would be insoluble. Okay? And then finally, sulfate is kind of works two ways, all right? So many salts containing sulfate are soluble, but there are enough exceptions to make sure you know, make sure you really pay attention to this. But strontium, barium, lead, and mercury, if those cations are present, then that salt would be insoluble. 
Okay, so now there are some general rules for predicting insoluble salts also, okay? And the first group are the hydroxides and the sulfides. So if they contain hydroxide or sulfide, then they're probably insoluble. But again, there are plenty of important exceptions. And so anything containing an alkali or group 1 metal, so lithium plus, sodium plus, potassium plus, rubidium plus, and cesium plus, all those guys, those would be soluble. And another important exception is heavy alkaline earth metals. So calcium 2 plus, strontium 2 plus, barium 2 plus. So when we get to bases, you're going to see that calcium hydroxide, for instance, is soluble. It dissolves into solution. It is a strong base. Okay, so now uh, carbonates and phosphates. Most of those guys are insoluble, okay? But again, important exceptions. Anything containing group 1 metal, okay, so that's all these guys again. And ammonium, so if it contains those, they're soluble, okay? And so I've listed all of the cations here. And then finally, getting back to sulfate, many salts containing sulfate and cations with charges greater than or equal to 2 are insoluble, okay? And so here are the exceptions listed from the previous slide. But anytime you see a cation charge, equal to or greater than 2, then you should start being suspicious that perhaps this compound is actually, this salt is actually insoluble. And again, important exceptions, alkali metals and ammonium. Those are all soluble. And if sulfate is bonded with magnesium, it is also soluble. Okay, so is it soluble? So what we're going to do is learn to use the solubility rules in order to decide whether each salt is soluble or insoluble. And we're going to rationalize or explain our answer, okay? So go ahead and pause the presentation, use the solubility rules, and figure out whether each one of these guys is soluble or insoluble. Okay, so let's look at sodium chloride first. Now we've talked a lot about this guy. So you probably already knew it's soluble, but what we want to do is make sure that we can rationalize it and, and, and explain it, okay? And sodium chloride is a good example from the standpoint that sodium cation and chloride anion are both on the list of almost always soluble, okay? And so we would predict that the salt is soluble, and, and, and indeed it is. Now that would also go for something like potassium chloride or cesium chloride, okay, or rubidium chloride or sodium bromide or sodium iodide, all those guys are going to be soluble. All right, now, barium sulfate contains sulfate. All right, so we have to be suspicious. Now, this ionic compound is composed of barium 2 plus cation and sulfate anions, okay? Now, salts containing ch cations with charges of 2 or greater tend to be insoluble. So we would predict this guy to be insoluble, even if we didn't see it on the exception list. Okay? And then finally, this is ammonium chloride. All right, so the ammonium cation, chloride anion, again, also contains two ions that are generally found in soluble compounds, and that's ammonium and chloride. So we would predict the salt to be soluble. Okay, so now... Now that we know how to predict whether something is soluble or not, we're going to apply it in precipitation reactions. Now these reactions happen when you take two solutions of soluble salts, okay, you mix them together, an exchange reaction happens, and we're going to talk about what that is. You should have some idea from when we went through them briefly earlier on, but we're going to go into it a little bit more depth now. And then after that, after that exchange reaction occurs, one of the salts formed is insoluble. And if that happens, then you get a precipitation, which is a solid that forms and then settles to the bottom of the container. Okay, so here's kind of a pictorial view, okay? So here are two solutions of soluble salts. Now, I didn't have enough room to make them in containers, so... There's a whole bunch of these guys in one, and they're soluble, so they separate out into ions. So we're going to remember they're electrolytes. They're going to separate out into ions. Same with this guy in solution, separating out into ions, okay? And so here's a picture of both of them mixed together before they've had a chance to react. 
okay? So we just barely mixed them together and the soluble salts dissolve into ions and they're just hanging out in solution. Now, basically almost immediately, if a precipitate is gonna form, it's gonna start right away. And so now we're gonna watch this solution in time and we're going to see that we have formed an insoluble substance, okay? And so that's going to settle eventually to the bottom of the container. And then these other ions that are soluble, they're just going to be hanging out, okay? So they're still in solution. So we formed an insoluble substance, and the remaining ions are just there in solution. They're just hanging out in solution. Okay. So let's look at an actual example, a chemical reaction. So now when we mix potassium chloride and silver nitrate, we're going to get silver chloride solid, okay? Now we can rationalize this using our solubility rules, potassium chloride, group one metal, and chloride, so that's a soluble salt. Silver nitrate, things that contain nitrate are soluble, and so we know both of those solutions have soluble salts. Now when we mix them together, then we also know that, so that silver chloride forms, okay? Now if we check our solubility chart, we're going to see that for chloride anion, silver plus is one of the exceptions, all right? So it forms a solid, and that's the precipitate. And then these remaining ions, so the partners from these two guys, they are aqueous ions in solution. Now I know it looks like they're together right now, but they're not. They're aqueous ions, so they've dissolved into ions, and then this solid has formed, okay? Now, one of the ways that it's a little bit easier to see this is to write it out with all of the ions as reactants, and then all of the ions, and then the solid in the products, okay? So what I've done is just break these guys up, okay? So potassium cation, chloride anion, silver cation, nitrate anion. Okay, so here they all are, and they're all aqueous. Those are soluble, okay? Now they react here, and here's our insoluble salt, silver chloride, and then look, see there are the potassium and nitrate anions, potassium cation and nitrate anion just hanging out in solution. Okay, so this is an exchange reaction, okay? So chloride comes over here, and reacts with silver cation, okay? Potassium over here doesn't really react with nitrate, all right? So those guys form another soluble salt, so that just means they stay as ions in solution. And But silver chloride is an insoluble salt, so these guys react, form a solid, and then drop to the bottom of the container. These guys remain in solution, all right? Now, if one of the products is insoluble, you're going to see a precipitate. If not, then you won't see a precipitate and no reaction occurred. That's what we would say. Okay, so spectator ions. All right, now certain of those ions didn't end up reacting. So potassium cation didn't react and neither did nitrate anion. Okay, and so these guys are called spectator ions. That means they are just there to keep the charge balance in the solution neutral. Okay, and spectator ions, you know, they're just, like I say, just hanging out, and usually we cancel them out on both sides of the equation. So you can see in this whole ionic equation, we have potassium cations on both sides, and we also have nitrate anions on both sides. And then we're left with just the stuff that makes silver chloride, all right? So chloride anion and silver cation makes our silver chloride solid, okay? Oops, have to get rid of that plus sign there. Now, this down here, that is called the net ionic equation, okay? So that's the equation that is left over after everything that shows up on both sides of the equation is canceled out. So all the spectator ions are canceled out. Okay, so here's your little quiz. So pause the presentation, mix these two soluble salts, and figure out if a precipitate forms, and if so, write the net ionic equation, and then also identify the spectators. Okay.
So first thing, let's remind ourselves that we have indeed mixed two soluble salts. And we use the solubility table to do that, okay? At least until we have it kind of in our working memory like I do. So we're going to rem remember that salts containing bromide are soluble, okay? And so calcium bromide, we would predict that to be soluble, and it is. And we also find that salts containing carbonate and an alkali metal cation, so group 1 cations, that's sodium, all right? Those are soluble, and this salt is soluble also. So we have mixed two soluble salts. Okay, so now that we know that both the salts are soluble, let's go ahead and exchange the ions and see if we have an insoluble salt that formed, okay? So what we're going to do is we're going to take calcium, we're going to pair it with carbonate, we're going to write it right there. We're going to check that's calcium 2 plus, that's carbonate 2 minus, so good. We're okay, that's balanced, that's charge balanced, okay? Then we're going to take bromide anion and pair it with sodium cation, okay? And we're going to make sodium bromide. Now, notice that I did these two subscripts here, those are to make these compounds charge balanced. Now, you notice that I didn't take those and make sodium 2 bromide 2, okay? What I did was put a coefficient in front of sodium bromide before it to show that it made two of them because we want to write the empirical formula for the ionic compound as the formula, and then we show that we made two moles of it by putting a coefficient in front of it, okay? So again, don't take these subscripts. Those are That just shows that it takes two, two sodium cations at plus one each to balance out the charge on a carbonate anion that is two minus, okay? So, we, but you're just looking at the anion and the cation that get together to make the compound, and then you made two moles of it, okay? So then you have sodium bromide. Is either one of those two guys insoluble? So you want to check the table, so pause and make sure, and then we'll talk about it. Okay? Yeah, well it turns out that calcium carbonate is insoluble. Okay, so most carbonates are insoluble. There, it's not a, Calcium carbonate is not on the exception list, so it is insoluble and it forms a precipitate. Now, sodium bromide, again, sodium cation, alkali metals, almost always, well, always soluble, and bromide anion, almost always soluble, unless it's one of the exceptions, which of course sodium is not. So we have one insoluble salt, and then these two guys are aqueous, so they just hang out as ions in solution. Okay, so now let's write out the entire ionic equation, okay? And we're going to cancel out our spectators, okay? So we're going to break apart this guy first. So calcium 2 plus and two bromide anions, okay? Plus sodium 2 plus, two of those, see, up here. And then one carbonate anion, all right? And we're going to get two sodium cations on this side, two bromide anions on this side, and calcium carbonate. So that's our whole ionic equation. So now, after we canceled out our spectators, then we're going to have a net ionic equation where we have carbonate and calcium cation, and we're going to form calcium carbonate, and our spectators, of course, are sodium and bromide. That should say bromide. Okay, so what should you be able to do with this? Well, you should be able to identify soluble and insoluble compounds using the solubility rules, okay? And you are going to be able to predict whether a precipitate forms when you mix two solutions of soluble salts, okay? You're going to identify it, and then you're also going to identify any spectator ions. Now, you'll also note when there is no reaction if no insoluble substance is formed. So, like, if you mix these two solutions of soluble salts, and both of them, you exchange the anions and the cations with each other, and then you end up with two new salts and both of them are soluble, then basically we would write no reaction, okay? But we're going to assume that there is a reaction that an insoluble compound is formed, and then we're going to write the net ionic equation for that and identify those spectators.